watched it and did. Good evening. I'm glad you've joined us for a further study in the Gospel of Mark this uh, Wednesday evening. As I'm filming this, <clears throat> I decided it's too warm for a fire, and um, so I thought you might uh, like to try uh, this view. Uh, this has been a difficult time for all of us. I know it has for you and for your family. We're all beginning to hear about friends who are victims of this uh, virus. And so it's a difficult time <clears throat> for us. And this, this evening for our prayer, before we begin our Bible study, I'd like to use one that has been attributed to St. Augustine uh, back uh, in the 400s. Watch thou, dear Lord, with those who wake or watch or weep tonight, and give thine angels charge over those who sleep. Tend thy sick ones, O Lord Christ. Rest thy weary ones. Bless thy dying ones. Soothe thy suffering ones. Pity thine afflicted ones. Shield thy joyous ones and all for thy love's sake. Amen. May that be our prayer in difficult times. We've been studying the Gospel of Mark, looking at the portraits of Jesus that Mark draws for us in his Gospel. What we have done so far is that we've looked at the fact that this is the first Gospel, that it is really the last week in the earthly ministry of Jesus uh, including the crucifixion, the resurrection. It is simply that account, for that's almost half the gospel, with an introduction uh, before that. And we looked last time at the emphasis on the kingdom of God. I guess if you remember no more than two things about this study, let them be this. First of all, that Mark's gospel is snapshots. It's action all the way. So different from, say, the fourth gospel. And secondly, remember that it is about the kingdom of God. That is the stack pole of the entire gospel. So let's pick it up there. And uh, today I want to talk with you uh, about, uh, first of all, the messianic secret. Uh, I hope you've got your Bible because we'll be looking at a lot of scriptures. When we uh, look at this gospel, we'll find that there's something very unusual about it. Let's look at a few scriptures, and I think you'll pick it up immediately. Um, <clears throat> let's uh, turn to chapter 1, the very first chapter of Mark. We'll sort of work our way through, and as I turn to the passages, you probably will have time to do the same. Uh, look here at the very first chapter, um, and you will find in verse 34 how Jesus drives out demons but he would not let them speak because they knew who he was. We'll come back to that business of demons later. But notice here that he silences even the demons for talking about who he is. Uh, look at verse 43 and following. Here is a man with leprosy. And he cures the leprosy, but look at verse 43. Jesus sent him away at once with a strong warning. See that you don't tell this to anyone. Go further. Look at chapter 3. Let's pick that one up. Uh, look at verses 11 and 12 there, where the crowds are following Jesus, and he is <clears throat> healing people, casting out devils. But look at verse 11. Whenever the evil spirits saw him, they fell down before him and cried out, you are the Son of God. But he gave them strict orders not to tell who he was. Now, I think he's talking about the evil spirits there. It could be that it is the crowd who watches this that he tells not to tell. But I think it's the evil spirits there, really. Uh, look at chapter 5. As you just keep walking through this gospel, you will find uh, this particular emphasis uh, in chapter 5, you remember how he healed the woman with a hemorrhage and then heals the daughter of the synagogue uh, leader. But when he raised her up, Talitha Kum, 
They were astonished in verse 43. He gave strict orders not to let anyone know about this and told them to give her something to eat. Well, march on to chapter 7. Uh, here we find in verse 36, um, here is a deaf and mute man who is healed. And uh, remember how uh, the man's ears are open, his tongue was loose, but look at verse 36. Jesus commanded them, the crowd around him, just like he commanded those in the room there in the earlier verse where he healed the little girl. He tells those around, do not tell this. He told that man, uh, not to. he told the folks there, not to tell anyone, but the more he did so, <laughs> the more they kept talking about it. Well, look at chapter 8. Look at verse 26 there. Uh, here we find there uh, the healing of a blind man uh, at Bethsaida. You remember how he healed the man? I look at verse 26. Jesus sent him home saying, don't go into the village. Just don't let anybody know what's happened. Just go home. Do you see what's going on here? What Jesus is telling them is don't tell anybody who I am. Now, I think there's a reason for that. And the reason is this. The people were expecting a Messiah, yes, but they were expecting someone like King David, someone who would expand the borders of the kingdom, someone who would be warlike, who would conquer the surrounding area, somebody in this particular time who, who would chase out the Roman Empire. And that's not who Jesus was. That's not the kind of Messiah he was going to be. He was going to be the Isaiah kind of Messiah, the suffering servant. That's what we find there. And so notice that this emphasis all happens before the great confession. That's in chapter 8. Look at Peter's confession. And then Jesus predicted his death again. Now, we only find him telling people not to tell one more time, and that's in chapter 9, uh, where we find... In verse 9, he has to warn the disciples as they were coming down the mountain after the transfiguration. Jesus gave them orders not to tell anyone what they had seen, and here's the key, until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. So I think the reason for Mark's messianic secret, don't tell people who I really am, was to give Jesus time to prepare his disciples to teach them the true meaning of, of the kind of Messiah that he was to be. Now let's go to another emphasis here in Mark. I think we have time to do a couple of more things. Jesus and the demons. I said I'd come back to this, but there is an emphasis in this gospel uh, on demons more so than in the other gospels. <clears throat> Again, go back to chapter 1. And we'll start going through Mark again. In chapter 1, <clears throat> if you look at verse, um, let's look at verse 24. Um, he heals a man there in the synagogue. And notice what the evil spirits, the demons say when uh, they are cast out. Uh, the man is in the synagogue possessed by an evil spirit. And the man or the spirit cries out, What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of Israel. So you see, they know the Holy One of God. They know who he is. And he tells them, don't tell it. So they are even included in that Messianic secret. If you look at um, verse 39 in chapter 1, we find that Jesus goes throughout Galilee preaching in the synagogues and driving out demons. There is that emphasis on the demonic in this gospel. Look at chapter 3. Uh, go to verse um, 11 here where the crowds are following Jesus. And again, 
whenever evil spirits <clears throat> saw him, they fell down before him and they cried out, You are the Son of God. But he gives them strict orders not to tell anyone. By the way, <clears throat> you see, it isn't that the devil doesn't know he's defeated and it isn't that the demonic uh, empire that he rules uh, doesn't understand. They know it. They know their time is short. And it is a battle to the death with the demonic. Let's go further. Um, chapter 5. We'll just take a quick look at that. Here is a whole chapter devoted to this. <clears throat> Remember that he goes across to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, and there we find what we call the Gadarene demoniac. Here is a man who has been <clears throat> cast out of society. He lives by himself out in the cemetery, in the tombs and the caves on that side of the Sea of Galilee. And Jesus comes and he asks the man at the beginning, let me read for you, or let's read verses 6 through 12. You can follow along. That when this man saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and fell on his knees in front of him. He shouted at the top of his voice, What do you want with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? Swear to God you won't torture me. For Jesus has said to him, Come out of this man, you evil spirit. Then Jesus asked him, What is your name? My name is Legion, he replied, for we are many. And he begged Jesus again and again not to send them out of the area. A large herd of pigs was feeding on the nearby hillside. The demons begged Jesus, Send us to the pigs, allow us to go into them. And he gave them permission you know the rest. They went into the pigs. The whole herd ran down the slope. <clears throat> what we see here is the demonic. They know they cannot overcome Jesus. And we see that he is master uh, even of them. Let's look at one other emphasis uh, today, and that is the humanity of Jesus. You know, if you go through and count them up, you'll come up, I think, with about 81 times that Mark refers to Jesus simply as Jesus. Now, that was, it was a very common name. It'd be like William or Robert or John in our time. A very common name. And that's how he refers to Jesus. 81 times, just like your neighbor, just like your friend and leader. You find in chapter 6 here of Mark, we see the wonder of the disciples as he walks on the water. We read there he, um, he was walking on the lake, and when they saw him, they thought he was a phantom, a ghost. And they cried out because they all saw him, and, and they're terrified. Because they thought he was just the neighbor to start with. And they find out that he is much more. But he is very human in this gospel. You can see his anger in chapter 3 uh, back here with the religious leaders who, who will not believe. And you find that he is, verse 5 of chapter 3, he looked around at them in anger and deeply distressed at their stubborn hearts. He can get angry. He can. Uh, they are afraid when they see him on the water. Uh, in chapter 10, we see him how he loves the little children. In chapter 10, look at verse 14 there. When the people were bringing the little children to Jesus. And uh, when he saw the disciples uh, turning them away, uh, it says that he was indignant and set them, said to them, let them bring the children. More interestingly than this, we notice that Jesus does not know all things. Uh, don't, don't let that flip you now. This has nothing to do with whether Jesus is divine, whether he is the Son of God. He himself said that he did not know when the end would come. I know a lot of preachers feel like they know, but Jesus said only the Father knows these things. Uh, we see his humanity here. We Baptists are real good about the divinity 
of Jesus. We're not so good at the fact that he is both human as well as divine. We see his agony in the garden when even Jesus asked, can this be taken away? And he says, not my will, but your will be done. Interestingly enough, we see the humanity of Jesus in this fact, that his power is limited by the doubts of the people around him. One of the most amazing passages in the Bible is found here in Mark in chapter 6. Turn with me to Mark chapter 6 here. <clears throat> this is when he goes back to his hometown. And his disciples are with him. The Sabbath comes. He goes to the synagogue to teach. And um, the people are amazed at his teaching. And they say, you know, what is this wisdom? Isn't this the carpenter? Isn't this Mary's son? Isn't he the brother of James and Joseph and Jude and Simon? And aren't his sisters here with us? By the way, take note of this. Jesus is one of seven children in that household. He has four brothers and at least two sisters. That makes seven with himself. And they took offense at him, the people did. And Jesus said, Only in his hometown, among his relatives, and in his own house is a prophet without honor. Now listen to verse 5. He could not do any miracles there except lay his hands on a few sick people and heal them. And he was amazed at their lack of faith. He could not do. Mark doesn't say he got mad and wouldn't. He could not do because of their lack of faith. That bothered Matthew. And if you go and compare that same passage in Matthew, Matthew doesn't say he could not do. He just said he didn't do very many miracles there. He didn't want the humanity of Jesus to show through quite as much as, as Mark did. Well, let's sum it up then. There is no pale Galilean here as we have in some poetry and, and some hymns. But here is someone, as I think I said in an earlier part of our study, here is a Michelangelo kind of strong-muscled man. This is the Son of God who marches across this world doing battle with the devil. He is powerful. He is magnetic. He marches toward his destiny. He takes his disciples and those who will believe with him. Maybe a hymn that at this time of the year also expresses how Mark sees Jesus might be a hymn that many of us uh, would like to be singing, but we're going to be social distancing this, this Sunday on Easter. But listen to these words of the Easter hymn. Lo, in the grave he lay, waiting for the coming day, Jesus my Lord. Vainly they watch his bed, vainly they seal the dead, Jesus my Lord. Death cannot keep his prey, he tore the bars away. Jesus, my Lord, up from the grave he arose. I trust you'll have a blessed Easter. And I want to invite you to worship with us at Middle Fork Baptist Church by the media as we celebrate this coming Sunday morning Jesus' resurrection and our promised resurrection. We'll be looking at why that angel sat down. I hope you'll join us.